afternoon. And thank you for tuning in to this 10th annual Auschwitz Klein History Lecture, sponsored by the History and Archives Committee at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, Wednesday, October 27, 2021. I am David Klein, adjunct professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and I'm co-chair with Kerman Minerva of this committee. I wish to announce that I have no commercial financial interest to disclose. I do disclose that I have a financial interest in the academy by having the honor of making a financial contribution to the academy used to support its history projects, one of which is this history lecture. I am the Klein of the Nusbitz Klein Lecture. Ginger Anthony, past executive officer, encouraged me to make this contribution, and I, in turn, want to encourage you to do something of the same. Remember, it is in giving that we receive. The Nusbitz Lecture began in 1997 in Toronto, Canada. Through the years, the subject matters have, and speakers have been wide-ranged with emphasis on the cultural, the artistic, and the history of excellence, the American exceptionalism, and how each of us might achieve it. This lecture is named in the honor of Joe Nusbitz, who is Academy President in 1975 and was a historian before the History Committee was formed. The committee was formed in 1992 when President Richard Cohen appointed Dorothy Bernstein of the University of Minnesota as chair. Dorothy asked me to be a member of the committee, and so I have been for the past near 30 years. Dorothy has departed us long ago, but her daughter, Gail Bernstein, is here with us and is a held an endowed chair in the Department of Psychiatry in the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Minnesota. Joe Nusbitz was the second chair. You can see his picture behind me. It is given by his dear friend, Jack Davis and Helen Davis, who were the founders of the Grove School in Madison, Connecticut, and dear friends of Joe's and the Academy. They made many contributions, many large con financial contributions. I would want to set the stage for this lecture as I've tried to do in the past years at these introductions. I think of the Academy as a family, an Academy in the way the Greek philosophers thought of it, a group of intellectual, curious individuals who gathered together amongst the splendors of nature and talked about things together. Through this, the love of learning transpired and that good feeling of knowing the truth or even something closer to the truth emerged, and with it a feeling of personal intimacy and connectedness. Today, our topic is diversity. Diversity has grown into the limelight from an incident that occurred in my city, Minneapolis, Minnesota, in the late spring of 2020. At a particular time, an African-American named George Floyd was murdered. But it wasn't just a policeman that was to blame. There is a shocking backstory that started at the beginning of our country that set the stage for this death to occur. Out of it came that proclamation that Black Lives Matter. Isn't it shocking that we have to be told that? Do you mean they didn't matter before this truth became evident? Wake up, America. So the polite way to address this problem is to talk about diversity. We are at the peace table now, and we hope that we can finally make it right. I now wish to introduce Dr. Kern Manure, faculty at Harvard Medical School, Boston Children's Hospital, and the continuing co-chair 
of the History and Arch Archives Committee, who will introduce our speaker. Gordon Harper will be replacing me since this is the last introduction to this history lectures that I'll be given. I'm rotating off the committee and I leave. I want you to know that it's been a really wonderful ride for me these past many years. I'm very grateful that I've had the opportunity uh, to serve this academy and my profession. I hope your ride is as joyful. Dr. Minerva. Thank you, David, for your exceptionalism and all your contributions to the Academy. Uh, my special thanks in facilitating this event goes to Janet Stout, Megan Redmond, and Jill Ziegenfuss Bradford and the Academy family, and to Gabriel Carlson, our president. Many thanks to all of you for joining us. It's a tremendous honor for us to welcome Professor Joan Reed as this year's Norspitz Klein lecturer, a leading figure in the United States in promoting diversity and equity in medicine. In the tradition of this event, I will take a few minutes in introducing our distinguished speaker. Joan has chosen a topic about the future in medicine and community grounded in history. She'll be using history as it were, as an evidence-based tool to help us understand and tackle issues of disparities born out of policies and practices of the past. The title of her talk is breaking ground, building a different future. Joan, we welcome you and are delighted to have you here with us to celebrate this lecture and your inspiring contributions. Joan Reed is Professor of Medicine and Dean of Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School, a graduate of Brown University and Mount Sinai School of Medicine. Dr. Reed completed a pediatric residency at Johns Hopkins Hospital an institution with a historic tradition of providing pediatric primary care services to the underserved since 1912 through the Harriet Lane Clinic, many of whom reside in East Baltimore community, about 90% of the children being insured through the Medicaid program. Subsequently, Joan Reed completed a fellowship in child and adolescent psychiatry at the Boston Children's Hospital. She holds MPH and Master of Science in Health Policy Management from the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and an MBA from Boston University. Since 2009, Dr. Reed has been a member of the National Academy of Medicine. She has served as advisor on the Health and Human Services Committee on Minority Health appointed by the former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Donna Shalala, as well as on the National Institute of Health Directors Working Group on Diversity. She chaired the Association of American Medical Colleges Group on Diversity and Inclusion, among other affiliations. Dr. Reed has created, <clears throat> has Dr. Reed has created several innovative programs in minority for minority students, residents, and physician scientists to address pipeline and leadership issues for minorities and women interested in careers in medicine and scientific research. These contributions include the design and implementation of fellowships and exchange clerkships in health policy, mentoring programs for underrepresented uh, minority youth from middle through graduate and medical schools, as well as training opportunities for middle and high school teachers contributing to the development of science curricula in public schools. These mentorship and training programs have helped advance diversity 
in the community and in the medical field. Joseph Needham, a British biochemist and historian once wrote, history of science is the guarantee of its freedom. The mistakes of our predecessors remind us that we, are, we may be mistaken. Their wisdom prevents us from assuming the wisdom that wisdom was born with us, an apt inscription for our times. In my conversations with Joan, I asked her who some of, heroes, some of her heroes were that deserve recognition for aspiring to alter our landscape in medicine, psychiatry, pediatrics, and child and adolescent psychiatry. She pointed to some of her influences, including the late Julie Richmond, MacArthur Professor of Health Policy at Harvard, former Surgeon General during the Carter administration, and one of the founders of the Head Start program in the United States. Through public example and personal relationships, he inspired many leaders, including a young Joan Reed, helping to achieve her dreams, making the world a better place for vulnerable children and families and students. Another influence included the late Leon Eisenberg, first in an academic department then at Hopkins to establish a training program in child psychiatry, later transforming social medicine and medical education for the greater good. Concerned about the plight of children in the inner city, Leon had examined the impact of urban decay, social pathology, and racism on the child and family and on society at large. He played a primary role in the establishment of the Martin Luther King Jr. Parent Infant Center, also in East Baltimore. An outquote from him that rung an early alarm bell for us, and he rung many alarm bells, was that the quality of medical education will be better as the medical students take on the characteristic of the population. The same principle applies to building our future in child and adolescent psychiatry. Another influence, a former trainee in psychiatry at MGH Leon, was Tony Earls, Professor Emeritus of Psychiatry and Human Behavior and Development at Harvard. We just recently had a media theater with him on Monday, and it would be available for view offline. Born and raised in the hometown of New Orleans, absorbed in the rich culture and immersed in music, playing the clarinet, he discovered racism when he moved to Memphis, Tennessee, when his father was offered a promotion. Tony once shared with me the shock of discovering that Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. He had walked out of the neurobiology lab on April 4th, 1968, at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, where he had been sequestered, unbeknownst, eagerly conducting an experiment, a transformative experience that led his passion for science turned from neurobiology to train in pediatrics, psychiatry, and child psychiatry in the service of the greater good. An apt quote from Martin Luther King Jr. that characterized this passion for social justice reads, we shall have to repent in this generation, not so much for the evil deeds of the wicked, but for the appalling silence of the good. Echoing perhaps John Stuart Mill's sentiments a century earlier, that the bad need nothing more to compass their ends than the good should look on and do nothing. I will be remiss not to mention Alvin Poisson, also in the picture, a beloved colleague, mentor and friend, known for his research on the effects of racism on the black community a renowned dean of the students at Harvard Medical School, born in East Harlem, New York, to immigrants from Haiti and living in the South in Jackson, Mississippi. Once, Poisson learned much about the racial dynamics, deconstructing theories of race models by white psychologists working in the field. I would like also to give tribute to Chester Pierce in the left bottom corner. Professor of Psychiatry, Public Health, and Professor of Education at Harvard University, an icon who became my preceptor and mentor. 
He later founded the MGH Division of International Psychiatry. Chet once gave me a book as a present with the inscription, Welcome to Fair Harvard. Knowing that he had been turned down on his application early in his career to psychoanalytic training on the pretext that he had too large a collective unconscious, I thought he was joking. He was dead serious because people like Chet, Tony, and Alvin have a deep-rooted belief in social justice and optimism and enlivened energy that fellow citizens, regardless of color or creed, will one day live in a free and fair society. The hidden curriculum can no longer remain hidden. And history is not only its witness, but also its evidence. Chet anguished in the grief for a great moderate leader in the loss of Martin Luther King Jr. He was among a leading group that founded the Black Psychiatrists of America. He joined, he coined the term microaggressions, a natural course of experience that they felt in their daily lives. In 1973, they asked for greater representation in the American Psychiatric Association committees and task forces. I quote, institutional changes as opposed to personality changes are needed to root out and eliminate racism. It was not a comment against Otto Kernberg, as I attest to Chet's qualities as an excellent therapist and an educator in child development and his interest in psychotherapy. It was an indictment of psychiatry and of the APA to commit itself to desegregating mental health facilities. The most fundamental demand made that morning, however, as Anne Harrington shares in her book, Mind Fixers, Psychiatrists' Troubled Search for the Biology of Mental Illness, was that the profession needed to begin to think about racism differently than it had in the past. Racism did not just happen because some bad people had hateful beliefs. Unlike many of their liberal white colleagues who were fascinated by the potential mental pathologies of individual races, the Black Psychiatrists of America, drawing on new sociological work, insisted that racism was built into the systems and the structures of everyday life, unfortunately, including psychiatry itself. I learned last week that the APA has reached its goal in endowing an, endow an award honoring Chet Pierce in international psychiatry. Also in this slide, as you can see on the right bottom corner is Ruth Simmons, who I have included as the first president of an Ivy League university, as a black woman, distinguished scholar, where Joan completed her undergraduate studies. And also we will see Carola Eisenberg, founder of Physicians for Human Rights, who passed this year, and Kathy DeAngelis, a friend and colleague to Joan and a distinguished professor of pediatrics at Hopkins. Moving on to my next slide, I would like to thank Ginger Anthony for some of her input on this list. Um, I like to turn to the history of the Academy and to acknowledge with gratitude several heroes in the Academy family. James Comer, a Yale legend who, turned, who ran the New Haven Intervention Project leading to the Comer method to educate the whole child and worked on President Obama's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence. Marilyn Benoit, Senior Vice President at Devereaux Behavioral Health and the past president of the Academy. During her tenure, the Academy partnered with the Child Welfare League of America, establishing a fund, as well as a Child Maltreatment Mentorship Award in her name. Tammy Benton, chair of Child Nuts and Psychiatry and the pioneering executive leader at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a member of the National Institutes of Health Advisory Mental Health Council. Leonard Lawrence in the bottom left corner, a distinguished child psychiatrist who began his career seeing kids in the US Air Force and once was not interested in child psychiatry, but was first to be sponsored for training in child psychiatry in the military, then serving 
as Dean of Students at University of Texas San Antonio, as well as a past president of the National Medical Association. The late Bill Womack, born in Lynchburg, Virginia, the first Black American to attend Thomas Jefferson's great university in Charlottesville, leading a remarkable career in child psychiatry as chair of Harborview and Seattle Children's, co-founding the Gay and Lesbian Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Association and making a lasting impact through his mentorship. Bill passed away in November last year. The late Betty Hamburg, a groundbreaking adolescent psychiatrist, first black woman to graduate from Vassar, where she once met Eleanor Roosevelt serving on the college board. First black woman to graduate from Yale School of Medicine. She pioneered the concept of peer counseling, contributing to health promotion of minority populations, a towering figure as president of the William T. Grant Foundation and as a member of the Carter Mental Health Commission. Finally, Jean Spurlock, a child and adolescent psychiatrist at heart, like Chet Pierce, a leading voice on the Black Psychiatrist of America, who served as chair at Mihari Medical College in her later years, and also as the deputy medical director of the American Psychiatric Association. Finally, with several minority medical student fellowships bearing her name within the academy and within the APA, and also recipient of the Elizabeth Blackwell Award of the American Medical Women's Association's highest honor. I'm sure Joan is in that league. I speak not as a historian, ladies and gentlemen, but in this instance, I speak as a witness in, to, his, to his history in the making. Quoting a historical novelist, Dame Hilary Mantel, who once worked as a social worker in the National Health Service Geriatric Hospital in England, memory like history is not like a photograph that may fade with time and not change it, uh, its outlines. Memory like history is a painting repeatedly touched up and corrected. And I repeat, corrected when times past is summoned. What comes to mind, however, is perhaps the greatest novelist of the 20th century, as Rachel Katzi Ganesh, her friend, recalls in the New York Times. Toni Morrison's last book, Hope, in it, Morrison reinforces the fact that her interest in history, or what she called re-memory, looking back, has hardly been in vain. Instead, she was prepared for what came before so it could be applied to the person who feels diminished or the readers who need to be reminded that they cannot easily turn their back on America's inherited history and those who are not like them. Who told you I was trash? The old woman of Lotus, Georgia asks the protagonist in Home. This is a question not just for her character, but for anyone who has been listening to Morrison's unforgettable journey. Who told you and why did you believe? I can go on, but in the new enlightenment era for us all, I will end by celebrating Joan and thanking her for graciously accepting to give this year's Noshpitz Klein lecture as I echo the title of her presentation once again, Breaking Ground, Building a Different Future and invite her to give this year's Noshpins Klein lecture. Welcome and thank you. I wanna thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Munir, and also for the honor of being able to speak today and a, a lecture that it was established with the name of um, Dr. Klein. So for both of you, thank you very much. I am gonna be talking about breaking ground and building a new future and talking about it from the perspective of understanding the past um, so that we can better know where we are today and build for a future of tomorrow. I have no disclosures to make. I'm gonna be talking about this historical context of race, diversity and inclusion in academic medicine and discuss some of the benefits of diversity, my perspective on the 
benefits of diversity and also some of the challenges that um, our students and trainees and faculty are experiencing, diverse trainees, students and faculty, um, and some approaches to advancing anti-racism, diversity and inclusion. Through understanding the policies and actions of the past, we can better identify the antecedents and precipitants of today's challenges. Persistent challenges such as health disparities, challenges to human rights, challenges to who belongs and does not belong, challenges to who matters and who does not matter, challenges to who leads and does not lead. We need to understand how historical policies, practices, regulations, included and excluded, understand the ways in which they have moved our nation in the past and can in the present be re-examined, rectified, and deployed in different ways and with different purposes. Ways that will move our health professions, our academic and healthcare institutions, and our society closer to the principles of social justice and equity that we espouse. Racial injustice is not new. Looking at the works of Michael Byrd and Linda Clayton and David H. Bautista and others, or even consider what we witness in social media and the evening news, we know that racism, classism, holding certain populations down and back have been with us for centuries. Isms are not new, they are alive and continue to plague our society. Undergirding this history of laws, policies, and regulations is a history of science. Science and medicine in Europe and the United States that would serve as fuel for racism and racist acts. Consider Linnaeus in the 12th edition of Systema Natura in 1767, where he labeled varieties of human species, including Americanus, red with straight hair, stubborn, zealous, and regulated by customs. Europanus, white, gentle, inventive, governed by laws. Asiaticus, yellow, severe, and ruled by opinions and Africanus, black, grizzled hair, females without shame, sly, lazy, governed by caprice. From Linnaeus to other scientists and physicians, many have sought to categorize, label, and define the races. Whether this taxis was based on culture, geography, or skin color, we came from a Eurocentric perspective, a perspective that did not place Blacks in a positive light. Other scientists would propose their own slant on race. Individuals such as Christoph Meniers in his book, The Outline of History of Mankind, who had two divisions, the ugly Black race and the beautiful white race. And also put forth the idea that the Negro felt less pain than any other race. And I'll return to this later. What should have been considered appropriate behavior given the circumstances was made pathological. For example, in the United States, physicians such as Samuel Cartwright in 1851 would describe this treatable mental illness that affected blacks called drapetomania. And it was associated with slave escape attempts. Other scientists sought to prove that blacks were a species different from white. And it was a clear hierarchical intent or perspective on who was valued more or less. The father of gynecology, Marion Sims, is also known for operating on black slaves, female slaves. And he's depicted here in a painting by Robert Thom with slave Lucy and other slave women looking on. These Pseudo-scientific takes on race were accompanied by policies and actions that served to exclude. And if we turn to an example from our past about homogeneity versus diversity, exclusion versus inclusion, inequity versus equity in Massachusetts, we turn to an example of injustice in education. And it's a story of Sarah Roberts. Sarah was a five-year-old girl who attended the all-Black common school here in Massachusetts, the able Smith School. And her father, Benjamin, attempted to enroll her in other schools, white schools, schools closer to her home, schools that were less dilapidated, but she was denied access because of race. 
Mr. Roberts wrote to the state legislature and eventually this case rose to the Supreme Court of Boston. The plaintiff was, her lawyers were Charles Sumner and Robert Morris, or Morris is one of the first African-American lawyers in the United States. And in 1849, the judge ruled against the plaintiff. However, Sumner helped Roberts to bring this issue before the legislature and in 1855, Massachusetts became the first state in the nation to ban segregated schools for the entire state. But we're well aware that segregation in Boston, in Massachusetts, in our nation did not end with this legislation. Both Roberts and Sumner's would continue to play important roles in our nation's history. Sumner's eventually crafting the document that was passed as the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and later was struck down by the Supreme Court. Most of us were not taught in our history and civic classes that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was not the first such legislation in the United States. And this Roberts case would have significance. This Roberts case where the judge ruled against the plaintiff in 1849 would be cited in Plessy v. Ferguson, the 1896 Supreme Court case that ruled in favor of separate but equal. King said human progress is neither automatic nor inevitable. Every step toward a goal of justice requires sacrifice, suffering and struggle, the tireless exertions and passionate concern of dedicated individuals. As a high school, college and medical student, I was unaware of the many remarkable individuals who charted the course that opened doors in medicine for people who looked like me. In my small world, their names had not been spoken and their stories had not been shared. Dr. James McCune Smith was the first black in the US to hold an MD, having graduated from the University of Glasgow in Scotland in 1835. He would also go on to become the first black to run a pharmacy in the US. And Dr. David Jones Peck became the first African-American to graduate from the US Medical School in 1847 from Rush College in Chicago. When she graduated in 1864, Rebecca Lee Kumpler was the first African-American woman in the United States to earn an MD degree and the only African-American woman to graduate from the New England female medical college now known as BU. She actually earned a degree as a doctress. Born in Dorchester, Massachusetts and graduating in 1879 from New England Hospital for Women and Children, now the Dimmick Center in Boston, Mary Eliza Mahoney was the first African-American to study and work as a professionally trained nurse. And when in 1880, Jose Barboza earned a medical degree from the University of Michigan. He was also the first Puerto Rican and one of the early persons of African descent to earn a medical degree in the US. He was also known for his political contributions for founding the first bilingual newspaper in Puerto Rico and introducing this novel idea of employees paying for the future healthcare needs of their employees what we might call as a very early health insurance system. Susan Picote would become the first American Indian to earn an MD degree from the Women's College of Pennsylvania in 1889. And Charles Eastman earned a degree in this same time frame from Boston University and would go on to found 32 Native American chapters of the YMCA. A little bit about my home institution, Dr. Munir's home institution, Harvard Medical School. The history of African Americans and our Blacks at Harvard Medical School begins with the American Colonization Society, a private philanthropic organization established in 1817, whose purpose was to purchase slaves and relocate them along with freed Black men to Africa. And their first colony established in 1822 would later be known as Liberia. Daniel Lang was born a free black in Boston and Lang and Isaac Snowden, another free black man who most probably attended that Abel Smith school that I mentioned earlier, both studied under Horace Clark, a surgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital. 
members of that con colonization society approached Harvard Medical School, requesting them to consider admission of Lang and Snowden in 1850. And here you see the letter to Harvard. In that same year, a third person, Martin Delaney, separately approached the HMS Dean Oliver Wendell Holmes seeking admission. Mr. Delaney was co-editor of the North Star with Frederick Douglass and also authored in William Lloyd Garrison's abolitionist newspaper, The Liberator. All three did matriculate in 1850. However, their acceptances were withdrawn following protests from a fraction of the medical students. It's important though to tell the fuller story and the story of perseverance, the story of Snowden and Lang and Delaney their journeys continue. Stoughton unsuccessfully applied to re-enter college, Harvard College in, or Medical School in 1853, but actually later completed his medical education, graduating from Dartmouth. And Lang subsequently left the US to study in Paris and then returned and also graduated from Dartmouth in 1854. And here you see a copy of his diploma that was provided to me by Dr. Jeanette Sevier Holloway of Tufts Dental School of Medicine. Martin Delaney did not eventually return to medical school. However, two years after leaving Harvard, he published The Condition, Elevation, Immigration, and Destiny of Colored People in the United States, Politically Considered, and would continue his career as an author, a journalist, abolitionist, and soldier. And during the Civil War, Delaney recruited thousands of men in the Union Army and was later commissioned a major in the 52nd U.S. Colored Troops Regiment, becoming the first line officer in U.S. Army history. During the post-Civil War and Reconstruction period, Harvard Medical School graduated its first physicians of African descent. Edwin Howard and Thomas Dorsey in 1869 and James Still in 1871. Changes were also occurring in the dental school where Robert Tanner Freeman was one of the first six matriculants for the Harvard Dental School. He was the first African-American to receive a dentistry degree from an academic institution in the US. And in this period, John Van Sterley de Grasse who graduated from Bowdoin College of Medicine in 1849 would be the first black admitted to a US medical society, the Massachusetts Medical Society in 1854, and would later go on to become a commissioned physician in the Union Army in the Civil War. Of note, the AMA that had been founded in 1845 was racially exclusive. And one of those responses to that exclusion was the founding of the National Medical Association in 1895. It's important to note that there was support from African-American community for students of color attending medical school. Here you see um, Lewis Hayden. In 1895, Lewis Hayden and his wife Harriet established a scholarship for the education of African-Americans. And of note, Mr. Lewis had been born a slave in Lexington, Kentucky, was a member of the Boston Vigilance Committee that aided fugitive slaves and later was elected to the state legislature in Massachusetts. To this day, scholarship is still awarded at Harvard Medical School in their name. In 1895, of the 385 African-American physicians in the United States, only 7% were graduates of white medical schools. 10 years later, in 1905, there were 1,465 African-American physicians in our country. And the majority were graduates of black medical schools, Howard, Meharry, Lenox, Knoxville. At that time, only 14% were graduates of white schools. In 1910, there was a sea change in medicine following the publication of the Flexner Report. Flexner wrote against proprietary and smaller schools, those that did not emphasize science or specialism and those with little equipment. And while this report served to advance academic medicine, it had mixed and lasting negative consequences for blacks. Flexner stated, the medical care of the Negro race will never be wholly left 
to Negro physicians. The Negro must be educated not for his sake, but for ours. He is, as far as the human eye can see, a permanent factor in the nation. He has his rights and due and value as an individual, but he has besides the tremendous importance that belongs to a potential source of infection and contagion. The Negro needs good schools rather than many schools, schools to which the more promising of the race can be sent to receive a substantial education in which hygiene rather than surgery, for example, is strongly accentuated. If at the same time these men can be imbued with missionary spirit so that they will look upon the diploma as a commission to serve their people humbly and devotedly. The Flexer report led to the closing of all but two black medical schools, Howard and Meharry. In assigning the mission of training black physicians to these institutions, it reinforced the exclusion of minorities at other medical schools. In advocating that Blacks be trained for restricted forms of practice, the report justified limiting their access to specialty training and advancement in medicine. In inferring that Blacks should be trained to treat Blacks, he provided the fodder for assumptions that remain today. Often the rationale posited for training minorities is so that they can serve minority patients and minority communities. Ignoring the fact that they can also teach and do research and lead, and that non minority physicians, actually all physicians, have a professional responsibility to serving minority and disadvantaged populations. So, what are the implications of a system of care pre and post flexor that was founded on exclusion and degradation of some? juxtaposed against inclusion, opportunity, and privilege for others. A system holding up science, but with roots in pseudoscience and erroneous beliefs about race that serve to enrich some while devaluing others. It is this system that is part of the underpinnings of an extremely troubling period in this country, a time when concerns about demographic and population changes and the economy would leave the poor, the disabled, the mentally ill, people of color seen as unfit, not capable of improving the genetic quality of the population. It was a time where eugenics first coined by Galton in 1883 would gain increasing footing in our society. It was leaders of this movement, such as Davenport, who raised immigration restrictions and sterilization as primary methods of control during this period, the US also began and carried out the 40 year Tuskegee study, the residuals of which have left communities doubting and mistrusting our health system. Implications that can be seen today as we try to enroll black and brown individuals in clinical trials. These are examples of the ways in which racism and bias in science and medicine can contribute to egregious outcomes. Questionable theories, beliefs, and actions at one point in time that were put forward as science became and have become ingrained in our structures, our policies, and practices to the point that we often do not recognize the origins as influencing actions and beliefs today. These egregious outcomes did not end with Tuskegee. The Family Planning Services and Population Research Act of 1970 led to the sterilization of roughly 25% of Native American women. This fight against involuntary sterilization was also seen in the term Mississippi appendectomy coined by Fannie Lou Hammer, who was a civil rights activist. In Southern states, thousands of women, thousands of black women were sterilized in teaching hospitals. And even in recent times, we continue to see allegations about hysterectomies being performed without consent. In the last 30 to 40 years, we've seen many changes in medicine, education, medical education, and changes in the demographics of our country. But this time is also marked by increasing documentation of disparities in health status and access to health care, 
among multiple populations. From Secretary Heckler's 1986 Black and Minority Health Report, the DHHS Healthy People Reports initiated by Julius Richmond and released every 10 years, to the 2003 Island of Unequal Treatment Report, and the annual National Healthcare Disparities Report published by R. Today, false beliefs about Blacks continue to percolate through our society. As shown in a 2016 report from the University of Virginia where medical students and uh, residents were found not to be immune. Researchers found that on average, these individuals in medical training endorsed 11.5% of false beliefs and roughly 50% reporting at least one false belief possibly, probably, or definitely was true. False beliefs such as Blacks age more slowly than whites. Black nerve endings are less sensitive than whites. Black people's blood coagulates more quickly than whites. Black skin is thicker than whites. Blacks have stronger immune systems than white. Importantly, these false beliefs about biological differences informed perceptions of pain. And those that endorse those false beliefs were less accurate in their treatment recommendations. These are medical students and trainees. At the same time, there's also the positive impact of science and the power of knowledge generation and dissemination, the power of individuals of different interests, different perspectives, and different questions being asked. Looking back, we realize that the findings from Drs. Kenneth and Miriam Clark, two psychologists, doll experiment, was important to the judges' deliberations in the Brown versus Board of Education. Their work suggested that segregation harms children and by extension, society at large. We know that the 1954 Brown v. Edu Board of Education decision by the Supreme Court ruled that segregation of students in public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It's also important to recognize that this case involved more than one person. It included five cases, more than 150 places, children and families, not just Linda Brown in Kansas, but also individuals in South Carolina, Virginia, Delaware, and Washington. Brown versus Board of Education is only one of many instances that depict the role of children. There's Emmett Till and the students of Little Rock in Arkansas, youth who played significant roles in our nation's march toward justice. There's the children from Birmingham, Alabama who were involved in the 1963 Children's March and the bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church also in Alabama. There's the power of us coming together, seeking and speaking truth, standing, marching, planning, and preparing to address injustice and inequity. Consider the words of Martin Luther King. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Or Lyndon Johnson in 1964, The War on Poverty. I've come here today to ask your heart and your hand, to ask you to join us in a similar cause, to help us to build a better land, to help us build a greater society, to help us open wide doors of opportunity. And we see the coming together, of working together in the work of uh, Julie Richmond and Belle, Betty Caldwell, who began in Syracuse with a children's center that later became the Head Start program. It's the power of we, the coming together to create change. And this message of we continues. Here's the Boston Common March around school integration in 1974. Remember, I talked about the Abel Smith School in Boston and, and Benjamin Roberts and the end of segregation in Massachusetts in 1855. Here's a march against segregation and for integration in 1974. It's the Harvard Medical School die-in in 2014 or the Brigham and Women's Vigil for George Floyd in 2020. 
the power of we versus I, the reawakening of the impact of discrimination and racism in education, in medicine, and across our society. It continues today, this March forward, as we look at statements from our government agencies, NIH and CDC, from our organizations that represent our institutions, the AANC and the ACGME, and organizations representing us as professionals, AMA and APA. Here in, we see the APA in 2021 um, dealing with uh, talking about uh, acknowledging racism and the making amends for both the direct and indirect acts of racism in psychiatry and committing to understanding rectifying past injustices and developing anti-racist policies that promote equity and mental health for all. Martin Luther King also talked about this importance of time and staying awake, adjusting to new ideas, remaining vigilant, uh, able to face change. And as I think about this, I think about stewards of change and individuals have, who created the space for us to move forward. And I'm gonna begin with two people from my backyard here in Boston. Solomon Carter Fuller represents a first in psychiatry. His paternal grandparents were enslaved, but in 1852 moved to Liberia a colony set up by the American Colonization Society that I talked about earlier with Lang and Snowden. Fuller was born in Liberia, but eventually made his way to Boston where he graduated from BU School of Medicine in 1897 and would go on to make significant contributions to the study of Alzheimer's. Chester Pierce, well-known, respected, beloved throughout our Harvard community and the first black full professor at Massachusetts General Hospital, is also featured in a recent children's book that tells the story of a Harvard University undergraduate being the first African-American football athlete to perform on the playing field of a predominantly white university against an all white team below the Mason Dixon, another part of the history of Chet Pierce. Broke ground in so many ways in coining the term microaggression. I think about these individuals from and these experiences that I've had that have set the stage for my perspectives and my approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Early experiences at Brown, of volunteering in Bradley Hospital in the Rhode Island Detention Center, in medical, medical school at Mount Sinai, but working with Dr. Lucille Gunning at Harlem Hospital and having this privilege of doing home visits with visiting nurses and seeing the impact of the social determinants of health and the lived experience of patients and families. And Dr. Horace Hodes, who helped me understand that as physicians, we work with patients. My residency training at Johns Hopkins and Sir Harriet Lehner, and this privilege of learning from Kathy DeAngelis and Jim Harris. My child psychiatry training at Boston Children's with Bill Beardsley, Dave DeMasso, Dave Herzog, Stuart Goldman, not was it here, but clearly important in my development, Gordon Harper. Individuals who I came to know from that time while I was with Boston Children's and Judge Baker, who have continued to serve as role models and mentors and guides, my heroes and sheroes, Julie Richmond, Leon Eisenberg, Alvin Poussaint, Tony Earls, Chet Pierce, Jessica Henderson, Daniel, standing on the shoulders of others who have come before. And with that, my perspective on diversity and inclusion, diversity helps us to realize our values, to address complex issues, ensures the viability and the future of our organizations and our professions. Too often in the past, it was the mission of our organizations, our academic medical centers, is tripartite mission of education, research, and service, and historically diversity efforts were mostly sidelined to a particular office or committee or person or day or week or month of the year, not fully embraced by leadership. And the need for change was not owned by and shared by the entire community. We failed to examine the ways in which diversity and inclusion can be fostered 
or hampered for our policies and practices. And here I speak about diversity and inclusion. It's an environment that seeks inclusive excellence, an environment where diversity and inclusion are embedded in the fabric of the organization, where, the, where inclusion and diversity are valued and sought and seen as mutually important, essential for success. In realizing values, I refer to the values of social justice and equity. The 2002 American Board of Internal Medicine talks about this charter of medical professionalism and mentions three principles, principle of patient welfare, of patient autonomy, and a principle of social justice. Or we could look at the 2001 IOM cost inequality chasm report that talks about these six aims in a uh, health care delivery services, safety, effectiveness, timeliness, patient-centeredness, e efficiency, and equity. Addressing social justice and equity serves to counter discrimination, ensure equitable representation, and support distributive justice, which considers equitable outcomes and socially just allocation of resources. Realizing values means moving from just letting individuals peek through the window, moving them to having a seat at the table and moving beyond that ensuring that their voices are heard, that they are active, respected, and valued participants in deliberations. It moves them towards being in positions where they help set the agenda, lead discussions, invite others in. It is not only about diversity, it's also about inclusion and belonging. It's not only about asking who's in the room, but asking who is not in the room whose voices are not heard, who has not had an opportunity to lead. This diversity encompasses multiple dimensions from the traditional that we talk about in terms of race and ethnicity and gender, sex orientation, sexual orientation, disability, but also expanding our understanding of diversity that includes diversity of knowledge, education, training, and skills. Diversity of connections, social networks, interactions, and population access. Diversity of cultural understanding and language and communication style and religious norms. Diversity in value, perspectives, interpretations, and first preferences. Much broader than what is just visible. In terms of complexity, I borrow from the words of Scott Page and unpacking this diversity toolbox and providing us uh, broadened perspectives, interpretations, heuristics, how we approach problems, predictive models. Thinking about diversity involves including people with different interests, perspectives. It's asking different questions, different ways of analyzing, new ways of thinking and seeing through different lenses. To truly improve the health of individuals and families and communities, we need to consider determinants outside of our offices, clinics, and hospitals. Social determinants that are impacted by the environment, the where and how people live, the options available to them, be it healthy food, safe living conditions, or toxic exposures, or quality education. We need to recognize the political determinants of health, those laws, regulations, and policies and practices that underpin the social determinants, the context and history behind the challenges of today, understand what has been done so that we can better understand what needs to be undone. Ensuring viability and projecting forward from 2018 to 2060, we can see that the percentage of white children under age 18 changes from 50% to 36%, increasing only students of color, color. These children who are our current and future high school graduates, college graduates, physicians, scientists, professors, will be increasingly diverse. And these diverse young Americans are our future, the future of our profession, the future of academic medicine and our research enterprise, and identifying them, encouraging them, nurturing them, providing opportunities for them to explore career paths, build skills will continue to be important. 
but what is the experience of these students? What is the experience of diversity in the professions and those who want to enter from the classroom to early professionals? And for here, I turned to Google and turned to the web and did a search to see what would my grandchildren see if they searched these terms? And I'm going to go through very quickly some of those images. This is a smart child. I can tell you that my grandchildren would not see themselves in these images of what a smart child looks like. This is a scientist. As we're telling these youth that there's a place for them and we want them in our profession, we want them to think about STEM fields and careers. This is the image of a scientist. This is the image of a professor. So what does somebody who is professional look like? This is a very different image. This is from 2020. If we've gone back the year before to 2019, there were very few people of color as this has become more prominent in the press. There people have been added, people of color have been added. But if we turn to what does an unprofessional hairstyle, what does an unprofessional look like? Looks like me. What is the message that we are sending our children? And what is the experience of individuals in our environment? What are the barriers to their advancement? Persistent barriers, barriers around um, from the individual level to the organizational, to the societal barriers around opportunities and resources, the culture, policies, and practices, and the societal level, the politics, the economics, what's going on in our environment. And what about those diversity taxes, the individual barriers that people experience, stereotype and stereotype threat, tokenism, lack of validation, being both hyper-visible and invisible at the same time, microaggression and bias, and expectations of service and these issues of isolation and exclusion. And what does this look like or sound like? It's being asked, where are you from? Or say, oh, you speak good English. You're so articulate. It's the person saying to me, you know, Joan, you're quite articulate and you're so competent. And my response being, I'm a dean and a professor at Harvard. I would hope that I would be articulate and competent. Why are you surprised? It's when someone says, when I look at you, I don't see color and I wonder what happened. Because when I woke up this morning, there was definitely something in the mirror that said I was black. It's this denial of individual racism. I have black friends. It's when someone says, I believe the most qualified person should get the job. And why would someone not think that I was the most qualified? It's pathologizing cultural values or behaviors. And why are you so quiet? Why are you so angry? It's the words that we use that include or exclude. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have a girlfriend or wife? That's so gay. They're a retard, lame, crazy, stupid. The words we use and bring into conversation that hurt and exclude the ways we evaluate and judge others. It's not just about race, ethnicity. Here you see this cartoon. That's an excellent suggestion, Ms. Triggs. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. It's taxes and the roles that pioneers play who enter these spaces where you're expected to be more competent to do the job, to fit. One of the, the worst words I hear in the English language, to fit into the organization, to make others feel comfortable with your difference, to represent your in identity group, to be asked to recruit and do outreach where others aren't, to over help others overcome their discomfort, to be questioning why we have a position or how we got the job, and to be asked to serve on so many committees and task forces and public appearances and not given credit for that work. And what are the consequences into this isolation and this exclusion, this code switching of trying to figure out what's the right dress, what's the right 
way to speak? What's the right approach to take as I move from one environment from one culture to another? It's being both hyper visible and invisible at the same time and understanding that how I am perceived is gonna be carried on to others of my race and ethnicity. It's these expectations of service, oftentimes given to me by an institution, but also something that comes from this sense of, 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 of respect and honor and desire to give back, this expectation of service, but also being under-resourced with, without adequate supports. It's this lack of validation for experience. It's, it's after this election with Obama and, and my walking into rooms and someone saying, we're post-racist society, racism is all gone. So the things that you're talking about can't really be happening. And this tokenism that reinforces this sense that you, this imposter sense that I don't belong and they're gonna find out that I really don't belong. The experiences of being different, the diversity tax. So what does this mean? What should we be looking for in our organizations? What are those signs that should give us pause? When our teams are not reflective of the demographic shifts in our society, when we don't challenge our old ways of doing things and believe in the myths that surround us, the anecdote, when we don't question who's in the room and even more so don't question who's not in the room, when we operate in our silos, when we are comfortable with the status quo, and the history that created this status quo, the structures, the policies, the practices, the words, the images, the images on our walls, who we, who serves and leads and speaks, who is seen, who's visible, when we don't acknowledge potential or when we are only reactive and not proactive, it should not take the killing of a George Floyd or another individual for us to step up. So what has been part of our approach very quickly from my office, the Office for Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnership, Diversity, Inclusion, how do we embed this diversity and equity across our institution owned by all? It's across these, these seven areas as we look across our programming, this continuity, continuity of effort from early uh, K-12 education across that full spectrum to our faculty levels with multiple points for entry, exit, and re-entry. It's consistency of effort with an understanding that it took us centuries to get to where we are now, and it will take consistent effort over a long period of time to undo that. Collaboration across our disciplines, across our institutions, collaboration within medicine and outside, collaboration with our community organizations and our schools, being creative and not doing what we've always done and expecting something different, communicating in different ways. If we want to reach the youth of today, we have to use their mechanisms, social media and other kinds of forms. It's this consideration of intersectionality. It's this consideration of um, the multiple identities that we all have the multiple forms of diversity and commitment, commitment across the entire organization from top down and bottom up. All of us need to own this space for moving forward on diversity, equity, and inclusion. For Harvard Medical School, it's now embedded in our mission statement to nurture a diverse and inclusive community. It's embedded in our community value statement where we talk about diversity and respect, but we also talk about promoting equity and social justice, those values. We talk about diversity as being foundational for us to achieve excellence. These unique perspectives, talents, and experience and contributions of our students, trainees, faculty, and staff are the foundation of that excellence. And with that in mind, have multiple programs from K-12 with curriculum development, teacher professional development, programs during the academic year and summer, programs that target start college students, medical students, postdoctoral fellowships and leadership and faculty development programs. And now embarking on what we call Better Together and it's a plan 
uh, that looks out over the next few years that says that we need to address our culture and our communication, that we need to develop people and put an infrastructure in place to sustain our efforts, that we need to hold ourselves accountable, generate new knowledge, and then we need to build community, community within community and belonging. So I had asked all of you, can we be anti-racist and not intentionally address the residual systemic manifestations of a history based on deliberate exclusion and not holding equal the value of all humans? Can we be anti-racist and not realize the critical importance of diversity and inclusion in fulfilling our professional values? in enabling us to address complex issues and in ensuring our capacity to remain viable in times of demographic change. What does this mean for us as, in, as individuals? It's becoming knowledgeable. Books, movies, courses, study groups, going beyond just unconscious bias training. It's taking time for self-reflection, understanding that we will make mistakes, but we come back and improve. It's taking a lens that says that our actions need to be data informed and evidence based, as we expect in everything else we do in medicine. We need to examine and rectify the power imbalance that exists in our system and question what we believe, what we think we know, and what is the evidence for it, and listen and learn from others and their experiences. We need to demonstrate real support, not just in what we write constructively advocate and build diverse and inclusive networks. And as we consider others, words do matter. Images and symbols matter. Have this grown growth mindset about ability um, and be active participants in growing that talent and nurturing and identifying the youth of today will take our places into the future, building their confidence and skills. Provide real support. Mentoring is important, but also time, funding, training, advise, mentor, coach, and sponsor. That's how many of us got to where we are today, still needed. So as we step up to this challenge of advancing diversity and inclusion, ask in the past, who and what were served by that exclusion? And in the present, what social, political, and power concepts might be disrupted by inclusion? And in the future, what are the risks to science and medicine if we continue to exclude? I've talked about a lot, but I think there is so much opportunity for transformation if we're informed by our values, our individual and personal values, the values of our profession, the values of our organizations, guided by a vision that change can occur, secured by a vigilance and understanding that if we don't keep our eye on the prize, if we don't continue to look to the future and where we want to go, we will slip back maintained by our voices, it's not enough to go in our corners and look and shake our head, but how do we speak up and become an active participant in change and strengthened by victories, big or small? Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Um, for the outstanding presentation, so comprehensive and includes uh, overall perspective in our uh, educational, as well as touches upon uh, our own field in child and adolescent psychiatry. And I think we have, um, I'm going to moderate the questions. Uh, first of all, you get a lot of accolades on the uh, questions. Um, and, um, Please post either on the question and answer se uh, section at the bottom of your uh, Zoom or um, uh, on the um, chat section. Um, and please don't be shy.
just because you showed so many historical photographs, uh, Joan, one of the ones that I think I got from the UCL library from the Welcome History of Medicine was the uh, prototype of a physician uh, that Galton had, and he had a collage of pictures, and most of them were these bearded, very aesthetic looking white males. Uh, so, um, not much had changed for a considerable period of time <laughs> until we uh, reached uh, this period. Com commentary and and I'm part of what part of what our challenges of today. Um, you know, if we look at in the academic medical space, there is an increase in the the percentage of women uh, as medical students as faculty, but it's still less than thirty percent if you look at the level of full professor in academic medicine. It's, there's roughly 185,000 faculty uh, across all of our US medical schools. There's roughly 300 black female professors out of 185,000. Yes. So we're moving forward, but there's still a long way to go. I want to um, pass on a comment by one of the uh, tributes that I gave uh, to our distinguished uh, uh, member of the Child Psychiatry Committee, uh, Marilyn Benoit. Uh, what an excellent presentation, how far we have come from 35 years ago when John, Jane Spur Spurlock, Harry Wright, and I tried having sessions on diversity at the ACAP annual meetings and no one showed up. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, and uh, Ronald Lee, Dr. Reed, how do you think medical schools can recruit more diverse classes of students who more reflect the general population? Is that Leon Eisenberg commented that I also put on the DS DCP, which I think has been a motto for, for some time, but you can comment on that, Joan. Yeah, no, no, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. You know, I think um, there are, are several levels. So one is, is actually being involved in helping to ensure that there are individuals who are prepared so that they could go to high school, go to college and come to medical school. So are we, and many of our schools are doing that. They're, they're partnering with uh, public schools and others around them. They're offering summer programs and other kinds of opportunities for students to be mentored or have research experiences and exposures. I think any and all of us can, as in our sort of academic centers, engage in our local community. For our office, we have programs that are local, but we also have programs that are national in scope. And I have actually a, a separate 501c3 started out of my office. It says over 15,000 individuals who come through it. So it can be done on different scales. That's one part of bringing in. I think we can also step back and start to examine how are we including individuals, looking at how we do our searches, be it for the students, or even as we start thinking about our trainees and we think about our faculty. Um, what are we taking into consideration? How are these things being set up and done? Are we looking at individuals holistically? Are we overly dependent on uh, scores uh, from standardized tests? Um, that this group truly knows are problematic um, in terms of what the tests were intended for, how those tests end up getting used, and how they exclude. And so how do we become more holistic? Um, and, and so recruiting differently, becoming holistic, I think looking at transitions where we drop off between high school to college, college to medical school, medical students in our, into our training programs, where are we losing people along the way? How do we retain them? And for me, large parts of that are about um, mentoring. They're about sponsorship. They're about uh, not expecting individuals to just sort of shore up and pull up their bootstraps and just make it, but understand the challenges, the kind of taxes I talked about, and what is the system doing to overcome those, not making it dependent upon the individual staff to address those. That takes leadership. That takes the kind of individuals who are here who have the capacity to say, wait a minute, why are we asking these individuals to do this? Why, are not, why aren't we giving resources? What are the assumptions that are being made? Um, to me, this is this self-examination as individuals and as organizations. Thank you. Um, Mark Borer is asking, we have the opportunity to model inclusion and collaboration and co-leadership at a time when there are in instead such worldwide risks of totalitarian control or diverse populations, which are the opposite of where our aspirations are directed. 
Um, I think that's a very sort of a general uh, comment, but uh, you might want to say something. And our uh, incoming um, uh, uh, president, Dr. Ng, thank you, Dr. Reed, for your wisdom, inspiration, and leadership. We're so grateful. So just want to pass the comment. Thank uh, so you. no, thank you very much for that. You know, I, I, what I'm going to say about this, the risks that exist today, and the risks have always been there. Um, they are more evident to some. Uh, the there has been a, in my opinion, um, an increasing um, allowance for what I would call bad behavior, um, and and for blatant racism and discrimination. That unconscious bias has moved into it, this out there open face bias. Um, there's a part for me that says we should not be surprised. And in the end that I was talking about vigilance, this is part of what that vigilance is about. You know, I talked about this Civil Rights Act of 1875 that we, the Supreme Court shot down. We came back to it in 1964. There are individuals, organizations and entities that would like to undo what happened in 1964. So it's not like we're post-racist, post any of this. It's still a struggle in moving forward. A lot has happened. I saw some of the things in the chat. I am not discouraged. A lot has happened in moving forward. If I think back to my growing up and my visiting my grandmother and, and going to this southern town where there was a railroad track through town and on the side she lived on, the streets were crushed shells. And on the other side, but it's all black side. The other side of the town, which is the white side, they were all paved streets. And I would walk with her downtown and we walked to stores where you couldn't go in the door and you couldn't sit at the counter. And when I would go down in the summertime, there would be the black school and the white school. That's not what we have now, but the residual remains. We continue to move forward. For me, we're now at this point at a Harvard where I'm the first black female dean in the medical school. That, 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 so that we're marching, we're marching slowly. And if we, again, not vigilant, if we don't keep our finger on this pulse, our, our foot on the gas, we will step back and we see it around us. We see in the news, it doesn't take a lot to understand that there are forces that don't want change. There are forces that are frightened of change. There are forces that are frightened about the demographic shifts in our society. So shifts are going to occur no matter what. So I don't think that the resistance is going to decrease. My sense is that the resistance is going to probably increase. But that means we need to work harder. It's very interesting. Um, I want to say um, that the French had liberté, égalité, and fraternité. And they objected to the word fraternité because it had Christian connotations at the time. And then, of course, the uh, liberté was too individualistic, but <laughs> it's sort of an interesting pull. But I want to uh, pass on Richard Howe's comment about the, um, the capacity for a mentorship that he was saying, you know, we can only take a few uh, at a time as an individual. But in terms of this guidance for mentorship, I, I guess you have some ideas because also you have across the board from high school to teachers to uh, medical students to postdocs. And so maybe maybe you can comment on that. So, you know, I, I, for me, I think of it as, as um, there are, are multiple levels in terms of mentoring and what different people call mentoring. So for me, when I hear the word mentoring or someone says, will you be a mentor? My next part is what does that mean to you? Because what's in my mind may not be the same thing that you're talking about. And so I, I think about, um, what I call as role modeling. I think about as brief conversations, different things I have with individuals. And then I have my fellows that, um, that I truly mentor and stay with for, for years. So occurring at different levels. I am a strong, strong, strong believer in getting very clear about expectations on both sides and in building mentoring networks and having multiple people who have different roles within and across that network about 
Um, this, this idea that one person can do it for everyone makes no sense to me. So how can we build in our systems this understanding of this is what I have to offer you. Let me introduce you to the rest of my network. Let me connect you with other people who can help you on your journey or your path. Um, and being very clear, the other part is I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Um, Ha's comment is, and I, but I think it's also a lesson for the mentees in this or the protégés in this space, is helping them to understand that we also have personal lives. And so for me, it's, 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 there's no part of me that's a martyr. It's how do I help the mentees understand that this is the time I can give, but I still have to write my grants. I still have other things I have to do. I still have to take care of my family and creating boundaries because they need to create boundaries too, particularly if they're people of color. They need to have, learn how to say no and create boundaries. So it's modeling for them. Yeah, thank you. So I also want to just thank Heidi Ford for joining and, uh, and her comments, uh, appreciation. Also, of course, from Ginger, who uh, is was are the you know has been our historian and leader in the academy for so many years, and mentions Jean Spurlock mentored every black resident or fellow that came to APA annual meetings. She made sure everyone knew of the growing critical mass, and um, that's her comment. I want to pass on also uh, because we have only. Can I just can I just say I just yeah, want to say please, one part should say Jean Spurlock was a giant. Jean, yeah, yeah. I mean, she was just. And so she mentored everyone at APA, but she connected to so many others. And I wasn't at the APA, but connected on so many different levels. Sometimes you're sitting down with people. Sometimes you are a guide and a light um, by very small encounters and by someone watching you. And Jean Spurlock was a guiding light for so many people. Thank you, uh, Ginger, for letting us know about that and reminding us about Jean Spurlock again. I, we only have like two minutes left, but. Uh, one comment that Dr. J.E. Edwards had put in and saying that the Harvard Stanford census data indicated that black and white girls and women were on similar paths educationally and vocationally, while black and white boys and men were not. The authors conclude this was largely due to systematic racism throughout the country. Do you have ideas of how this can be altered for boys and men? So I'm going to say that there's an issue for, for, for black girls and for black men, boys. Okay. Um, and one of the places I would suggest, given the time to turn to, is the uh, National Academy of Science, um, uh, Engineering, and Medicine has a round table that's looking at Black men and women and looking across that whole STEM spectrum. Series of report, multiple programs. Kata Lorenzen of uh, UConn is leading that. And I would look there in terms of ideas, um, summary of the issues, and recommendations about how to move forward in that space. Well, we have one minute. I'm just going to, I can't have said it better. Uh, Laura Gonzalez Conti saying, thank you, Dr. Joan Reed. That was beautifully said. I feel so inspired by your uh, leadership and encouragement to take action and use our voices to build a different future. Uh, thank you. Um, I think we are uh, just about uh, at the end of our uh, session. I want to again thank Dr. Joan Reed, Professor Reed for joining us graciously allocating the time to do so. Uh, it's a great honor for us to have you. And I think it will be a very important, it's, it's going to be recorded and I hope uh, training directors and others can see. And again, thank you, American Academy. Thank you, David Klein and honoring uh, Joe Noschwitz and David Klein history lecture this year. And uh, I would say goodbye and see you next year, I hope, and be safe and well. <laughs>